EA has released another Star Wars game at a budget price with a tight focus in both a campaign and a multiplayer mode. But is it good? Kind of, sure. But is it worth buying? That's a much more difficult question and one which I, Mark the Cyborg, hope to help you answer. I'll start off by saying that this video is going to be focused on the single player campaign, so if your interest is in a multiplayer Star Wars dogfighting game, this isn't really going to be a useful review for you. Personally, I think that multiplayer takes some time to develop as people start to get a feel for strategies and loadouts, so I decided to make this video now, within a reasonable time of the game's launch, to tell you about the general gameplay systems, as well as the story, rather than try to fake a deep dive into the multiplayer before the meta has really even formed. But if you're only planning on playing it single player, is this game worth buying? Let's find out, shall we? Star Wars Squadrons casts you as two starfighter pilots, one Imperial and one New Republic, as the bulk of the game takes place shortly after the end of Return of the Jedi. While it was initially thought that you'd be able to create your own pilots, it turns out that really meant that you'd be picking between a handful of pre-made character models. Most of them are pretty unattractive too, especially this one that looked like Ryan Kinnell. It grossed me out so much that I had to play as him. Dude, are you gay? During the campaign, you'll play a handful of missions for one faction before automatically switching to the next. There are two prologue missions, 14 main missions, and the action seems pretty evenly split between the factions, if weighted slightly toward the New Republic. But this is one campaign that keeps automatically switching back and forth between them, not two separate campaigns. Each faction obviously gives you a different selection of fighters, with the Imperials giving you access to the TIE Fighter, TIE Interceptor, TIE Bomber, and TIE Reaper. The New Republic gives you essentially equivalent ships with the X-Wing, the A-Wing, the Y-Wing, and the U-Wing. No, not Patrick U-Wing, it's the ship from Rogue One. Some missions lock you to one ship, while others give you a choice between a few of them, and your loadouts can be further customized from there. No matter which ship you're flying, you'll be in first person view with no option at all to switch to third person. If that's a deal breaker for you, that's that I'm afraid. But if you're worried about how it'll affect the look of each ship, the cockpits do differ quite a bit from each other, particularly when it comes to your field of view and peripheral vision. The open-air dome of an A-Wing certainly gives you a better look at the action than the closed sphere of a TIE fighter cockpit. When playing with a controller, you can click the right stick to free look around, but you have to click it again to regain control of your ship's pitch and roll, assuming you're a man of culture and are using the aviator control setting. This isn't an elegant solution at all, so the massive, opaque HUDs, which are in this game but were absent in the Battlefront cockpit views, give you what almost seem like paper slits to view through in some ships. This issue is mitigated almost entirely by playing the game in VR, to the point that my theory is that Squadrons was intended to be a VR-only game before an EA higher-up, quite likely correctly, said that they would sell a hell of a lot more copies if they made the game playable on traditional displays as well. But if you're looking at my footage wondering how I'm doing so well with the free look, it's because in VR I can just look around with my head to free look, and once I tried VR, I honestly couldn't even consider going back to playing on my monitor. It's that much of a game changer. Also, I had X-Ray Girl verify that this footage was watchable, so if you're watching this video and it's making you queasy, uh, bl blame my girlfriend. Love you, baby. In either case, I was playing on my Xbox One controller, as the Valve Index controllers weren't supported at all, and I don't have a flight stick, but that may have been a good thing, as I've seen some reports that the flight stick support is totally broken right now, to the point that it's unplayable. So thank you Microsoft Flight Simulator for making every wannabe maverick buy up all the sticks in my area, because them being sold out saved me from spending money on a peripheral that apparently has poor support in the game I was going to test it with. The good news is that now I can tell you for sure that the controller support in the game is pretty solid. The aviator control style which I found most comfortable maps the throttle and yaw, aka the gas, brake, and turning, to the left stick, while the right stick handles the pitch and roll, aka looksies up and down and spinning, which is a pretty good trick. I'll try spinning, that's a good trick. <laughs> The bumper buttons fire your two special weapons, the left trigger locks the target that you currently have in view, and the right trigger fires your primary weapon. The A button cycles through your current target, Y is used for issuing commands to your squad or requesting a resupply of your ordnance, and the B button fires your defensive item. Clicking the left stick gives you a speed boost, which can be used to pull off some slick drift moves like the one Poe does at the beginning of The Last Jedi, which as much as I hate that film, I always did think that looked pretty cool. The D-pad directions and the X button all hold functions which really set this game apart from Battlefront 2 space combat. All of these buttons are related to the power management system, which is a gameplay system in squadrons that's quite meaty and adds a nice little simulation flavor to the gameplay. 
If you're in a ship with shields, you can press down on the D-pad to split your ship's power evenly across your engines, weapon, and shields, or just between the engine and weapons if you're in a TIE fighter. I did appreciate that the creatives behind the game kept shields off of the TIE Fighters, because that's always been true in the lore, but I do wonder how it'll affect the PvP multiplayer balancing. In the campaign, it seems like the Imperial ships move a bit faster and hit a bit harder than the Republic ships, but it's hard to say for sure because on the standard difficulty, enemies fall pretty quickly regardless of which ship you're flying. Power management does have a pretty dramatic effect on ship speed and handling when you move power to the engines by hitting left on the D-pad, letting you escape missile locks or cap ship turrets in a hurry if you find yourself in trouble. If you move all power to the weapons by hitting up, your weapons don't overheat nearly as quickly and cool down much faster, which is invaluable for doing consistent damage to more powerful targets. Shield power management is even more technical, as in addition to shifting all power to shields by hitting right on the D-pad, if you press and hold X, you can decide to have your shields focus to either the front or rear of your ship if you're attacking or running from a powerful target. You can also turn on advanced power management mode, which lets you micromanage your power, which I, I didn't really have any interest in, but it's there if you want to do it. Overall, the experience of flying a ship in VR is quite good. You can bring your ship from a super fast boost to a floating stop and maneuver in all the ways you would want to maneuver a ship in Star Wars. I'm not personally an expert in spaceflight sims as it's been a couple decades since I was spending entire weeks marathoning my way through Wing Commander 3 or playing X-Wing Alliance, but I found the core gameplay in Squadrons to be quite serviceable from my perspective as sort of a space sim layman. So if you've got 3,000 hours in Elite Dangerous and you aren't satisfied with how in-depth I've gotten in this review, just know that I I'm not an expert in this type of game and you're probably right, I'm probably wrong. Please don't hit me. Squadrons isn't a blockbuster cinematic type game which takes you through arcadey, explosion-filled moments from the films. It's definitely a more subdued simulation, but at the same time, there is enough fast-paced action and eye candy to keep casual players interested. A lot of the models are pretty simplistic and the explosions aren't nearly as impressive as you think they should be, but the colored lighting and visual effects do a good job of making the game look at least aesthetically pleasing. I've got to hand it to the art directors for making the stages look quite distinct and attractive with all sorts of variations like colored nebulas, asteroids, space stations, and wreckage. Considering there are no in-atmosphere missions on planets, it's nice to see that there aren't really any missions which are just generic space and stars. In the cockpit, the game performed beautifully too. I was getting a frame rate above my monitor's max refresh rate at all times when I was playing on a flat panel, and a solid 144 frames a second at seemingly all times in VR. Although to be fair, my computer is a little ridiculous. Outside of the cockpit, things do not look very good at all though. While there are some pre-rendered story cinematics after each mission, most of the narrative is told through pre-mission home base segments. These segments look horrendous on traditional displays. Despite the awesome frame rates I was getting, it seemed like all of the character animations are like locked to 30 frames a second or something because whatever was happening, it all looked very weird. Things do improve a bit in VR, but there's still some Mass Effect Andromeda tier character animation happening, which hurts these segments a lot because all you really do between missions is look around your base clicking on characters to talk to. And by talk to characters, I mean you stand still silently while a character spouts a bunch of largely irrelevant backstory at you as if you're playing the Outer Worlds or Fallout, but with no ability to choose dialogue or interact with the conversation at all. Your character does chatter a bit during combat, but on the ground, both your Republic and your Imperial pilot are silent silent blank slates. This wouldn't be a problem if the characters who you interact with were interesting, but every character is super dull with a maximum of one or two character traits that are never expanded on in any interesting ways. You've got a Trandosian with a price on his head who gambles. Those are his traits and you can bet that he brings them up nearly every time you talk to him. There's an Imperial scene chick who really hates rebels. She'll kill any rebel she meets. Trust me, she's super scary. I will kill anyone, anywhere. Children, animals, old people, doesn't matter. I just love killing. There's a dude who doesn't take his helmet off because he's crashed too many times, and you guessed it, he tells you about the times he's crashed. The character I liked the most was actually the one that caused some controversy as Mitch Dyer's Twitter trophy, as Keo, the slightly Force-sensitive Republic pilot, had a very likable personality. Also, color me shocked that Keo's they-them pronouns didn't come up at all in the game that I noticed, so Dyer really was just pulling a Dumbledore was gay all along with his tweet. I know it sounds wild, but when Keo has a hunch, they're usually right. Don't listen to him, it's really not that big of a deal. 
Honestly, if I'm going to complain about any modern Lucasfilm wokeism, I was much more bothered that the Imperial Captain, Teresa Carroll, had an impeccably well-coiffed hairstyle, which looked very out of place for an Imperial officer in Star Wars. I get that they wanted her to have a gender non-typical haircut, but she looked like James Charles and it was distracting. I guess there's no shortage of hair product on her Star Destroyer. Go with the Furiosa buzz cut next time, that one makes more sense for a soldier. There are cameos from Wedge Antilles, who does mention Rogue Squadron, as well as Harris and Dula from Rebels, but you probably won't care about most of the other characters, and the story is very forgettable, so if you're interested in this game for a gripping Star Wars tale, it's gonna let you down big time. The story for Jedi Fallen Order was pretty decent, so EA might have been on an upswing, but if you consider that this same team wrote the story for the Battlefront 2 campaign, the low quality shouldn't be a huge shock. So with all that said, is this game worth playing if you aren't into multiplayer gaming, don't care about the piss poor story or characters, but just want to fly in some Star Wars ships carrying out some pretty well designed if simplistic missions? If you're playing on Xbox or if you don't have a VR headset for your PC or PS4, my honest answer is no. The flat panel gameplay just doesn't feel fantastic due to the cluttered field of view and using the right analog stick to toggle to free look isn't a very elegant solution. However, if you do have a decent VR setup, then I think I can pretty safely recommend this game at its more reasonable price point to Star Wars fans who want the in-cockpit experience. I honestly can't imagine Galaxy's Edge ever having an attraction which makes you feel quite as much like being in a starfighter as this game does. Although I've never been to Galaxy's Edge, so Astro and 3PO. It'd be a hell of a lot better if they hired some better writers and worked a bit harder on the story's presentation, but this game was clearly made on a more limited budget so that it could cater to a more specific audience, so I'm willing to go a bit easier on it for that reason. It'd honestly be nice to see more Star Wars projects with a limited scope which try to deliver a specific thing to some people, rather than every project be a kitchen sink game like Battlefront which tries to be a flight sim, and a first person shooter, and a third person shooter, and a Jedi game all at the same time. We used to have pod race games, tactical shooters like Republic Commando, flight sim games like X-Wing Alliance, arcade flight games like Rogue Squadron, all happening alongside the heavy hitters like Knights of the Old Republic or the original Battlefronts, and it'd be nice to go back to that. So if you do have a VR headset and are interested in the core gameplay, I honestly think you'll be happy with purchasing this game even at its full 40 US dollar price point, but if you're playing on a flat panel, wait for a solid sale on your platform of choice, or just skip it. Though it is worth noting that if you buy it on Steam, it does not boot up Origin the way Jedi Fallen Order did. This game is just on Steam for realsies. Also, if you're interested in the multiplayer for this game primarily, I recommend checking out Twisted Jedi's channel, as it was good to have him on the Gaming with Geeks podcast to talk about the game, and I feel like he'll give you better information on it than I could ever hope to. We can't all be Australian after all. Yeah, wrecked.